talking about making an effort to get back into a Christoph Historical Society. Well, today is, help me out, May 22nd, 22nd. 22nd uh, 2016, and I'm delighted to say that uh, we have today with us a lovely young lady. Would you introduce yourself to the camera, please? Okay. My name is Mabel Violet Durrell. I was born May 3rd, 1930, in uh, what was the Nash then the Nashua Memorial Hospital. My parents lived in South Brookline at that time, probably in the Barnaby House. And I was born um, the same time as the large fire in Nashua. So they were just so pleased with my birth that they practically burned the town down. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, bear with me one second, just want to check my notes. Okay. Um, Mabel, uh, what was the name of your parents? Uh, LaForest William Dorrell and Marjorie Louise Smith Dorrell. And how did they come to come to this town? Okay, um, my uh, grandparents um, had the uh, house uh, that they used summers uh, up on, um, what do you call that? Well, it's now called Route thir 13? No, 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 where Carl Smith uh, used to oh, but, uh, That's old, uh, old Milford old Road. Old Milford Road, okay. Okay, so help me out. Uh, they, they, uh, my grandparents had that house, and uh, my grandmother and the girls used to, you know, go up there for summers, and um, so that, um, you know, I mean, my when um, my mother uh, left uh, nursing, she uh, went back, uh, you know, to live up there uh, with my grandmother and to help. Uh, Carl out with his business and so forth. Uh, then um, my father uh, was born uh, in the Sandy River Plantation area of Maine. Um, and his birth certificate uh, was never found. Uh, the county seat, which the doctors used to go to once or twice a year and record all the births, uh, burned down that record with it. Uh, Grandma Haley, who lived in the neighborhood, kept a record of all the things that went on. So they rode up to her son Chauncey to see if they could get his birth date. And uh, Chauncey had knocked over the kerosene lamp, burned himself and everything up, and so there was no record. So to give him a social security card, they said that his birth date was probably uh, seven, uh, nine, yeah, 1880. And his sister was younger, and she swore he was sex number of years older, but of course that's not legal. They couldn't take that. But from what the family has told me, he, his birth date was probably closer to uh, 1877. Now my m mother's birth date, his was June 1st, but hers was June 3rd, 1897. Uh, and. Uh and my father came down <clears throat> from Maine. He was a woodsman, uh, rode the log drives and uh, worked in the woods uh, did, with teams of horses and so forth and did that. Also did uh, a lot of veterinary work and uh, used to tell me about the time when they had the big flu epidemic and so forth. Uh, he would act as doctor, nurse, and mortician, uh, you know, for the, the local people. And, uh, but he uh, came down into Connecticut with uh, the first portable sawmills that they had in this area. And then he came into Brookline. My mother was a practical nurse. I'm sorry I can't remember the names of the people, but she was taking care of this woman who had just had a child. And the uh, husband, walked into the house and my father behind him and said, oh, by the way, this is the hired man and he eats with us too. And so my mother had umpteen kids and the hired man to feed. So about that time she could have hit him over the head with something, I'm sure, you know, just one more thing that she had to do. Uh, and that's how they met. 
And, um, you know, it just, uh, that's how they both happen to be in the town of Brooklyn. Uh, and eventually they married. Yeah, they were married in 1925. And they said May 15th. And um, I was born in uh, 1930, and my brother uh, was born in August 12, 1932. Uh, my cousin Frederick Jepson was born in 1933, September. One month, one day, one year younger than um, my brother. You you mentioned uh, Carl Smith. Let's let's get our bearings on that. Okay, Carl Smith was my mother's uh, brother. My mother was the oldest in the family. Uh, then there was Carl, and then the other uh, two girls, um, uh, Miriam and Barbara. Barbara was the youngest. Uh, and his house that you referred to is the Brick Ender up on Old Milford That's right. Road, and he had chicken. He had a chicken farm. Uh, he raised hatching aids. Yeah, <laughs> hatching eggs for uh, Hubbard Farms. Okay, so your um, mother and uh, your father married, and uh, you think they initially lived in the Florence Barnaby house, you say? Yes. Th that's now this the one, historical yes. society. Uh, and uh, where did they live after that, if you know? Uh, well, in many places. Um, when my brother was born, which is probably the next place, they lived in uh, what we always called the Judd Hall place. Say it again, please. The Judd Hall. Judd Hall was um, a, a gentleman uh, who had a peg leg. And um, he thought that I, I was it, you know, uh, and uh, he used to have a uh, garden up there on the property and that they rented from him, and they also had a pony that apparently was belonged to one of the grandsons or, or something, you know. Where is this house? Uh, well, it's on what you call Mile Slip now, in Milford. Oh, okay. There used to be a road, and I don't know whether it's still open or not. They used to keep it open enough for fire uh, years back. Uh, but uh, be between Milford and Brookline, and it comes out into, um, you know, off the, you know, off the Mason Road end of uh, Milford, uh, up that way. And when you were born, where were they living? In, in the Barnaby House. The Barnaby House, okay. South Park Line. All right. Uh, eventually, uh, they made their way to what we now call Route 13. Right, and before the, that, um, <clears throat> Let's see, the, the corner of the street uh, that's called North Mason, I think now, that goes up into the, uh, what is now called a landfill. Um, that house, as you turn into that street on the right-hand side, it lived in there. Um, <coughs> the O'Hearn house down here um, at the foot of this street. Um, lived there. That was probably from there that they moved out uh, to North Brookline. Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, b bought the um, land uh, from Jim Day. Okay. And uh, my father uh, built, cleared the land and built the house. How old are you? At I was four okay. when we moved up there. It was just you and your brother? Yes. Uh, did you have any neighbors at that point? Yes. Um, the, uh, on the Brookline side, uh, there was um, Leonard Repon and his wife Ruth, uh, who eventually passed away, and um, Edward Sr. Gay and his wife Jean. <coughs> Eventually, Leonard Repon and Jean Gay uh, become, became married and uh, lived there. And then um, on the other side down the street was the, uh, Jim Day's place. Uh, Jim Day dug peat moss out of the uh, swamps, you know, the bogs and stuff that were down back of that house. And, uh, he apparently he did it other places too, 
and he evidently earned a very good living at it. When he died, he left money to the libraries of every town that he had earned his money in. And I know that Brookline and Mont Vernon were probably two of them, you know, but I, I don't know the others. And then down further on the other side was uh, Emil and um, Markey, M-I-R-Q-U-I-S, and um, Nellie, uh, his wife. And they um, were grandma and grandpa Markey to the whole neighborhood. Why? Just, just because, well, they, they had a grandson that used to come for vacations in summer and so forth, and eventually um, uh, came to stay with them for a while and was in school with us. And um, probably uh, around uh, when I was in seventh, eighth grade, sometime in the, in the early 40s, probably. And <clears throat> so they were grandma and grandpa. And down on the other side, um, were the um, Davis family, and um, I can't remember the father's name. Uh, one of the um, boys' names uh, was John, and the other one was Lester. Lester was um, what today they call challenged, and uh, but what Lester was a hard worker. He was good-hearted. He came up and he helped my father dig the wells and so forth that we had on the land. And when my father worked away uh, in the woods different times and would be gone all week, if we, my mother needed something, needed transportation, had to go and get my father to come home for something. You know, of course, no telephone, but uh, we didn't have one, and it certainly wasn't one in the woods where he was working. Uh, you go and Lester would, uh, you know, do whatever had to be done. And uh, <coughs> excuse me. even after my father died, he came to my mother and, uh, and of course, you see, I say Doral, which is the way it was pronounced when my father came from down east in Maine. When he came down here, everybody said Doral and he couldn't get them to change it. Mm -hmm. So when I took my maiden name back, I decided I was going to honor my father and it was going to be Doral. So, um, but Lester said to my mother, Mrs. Doral, if you need anything, just let me know and I will help you. There was a stone that stuck up a bit in the driveway. And it was right where, no matter what you tried, as you were heading for the garage, you hit that stone. So my mother decided she was going to dig it up. Well, like every other stone that's uh, in New England, uh, it's the tip of the iceberg. I mean, and it was a huge boulder. So, you know, she dug around it and decided it was well beyond her, and it was past my husband and I and my brother. So. Uh, she went to ask Lester to take care of it for her, and Lester came up and looked at it. And he said, that's okay, Mrs. Durrell. It won't grow anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we can laugh at his simplicity, but the thing is, if you own a garden spot, and you take all the stones and boulders and stuff out of it this season. After next winter, you have a new crop, so that the, the uh, forces in the ground thawing and freezing just push stones up. So as far as Lester was concerned, the sun was shining on it and there was no frost and he would get it out and it was not gonna grow anymore. <laughs> you know, so I, I, I just, um, I admired him in a sense, and he used to play games with us kids. And uh, you know, he, he would wrestle with my brother and, and so forth. Uh, he, he was uh, a good neighbor. And that was this side of Melindy Pond, which on a lot of mark, maps is called Larkin Pond. Uh, Marguerite and Willard Cummings. And they had their, a, a daughter, Phyllis, who was about four years older than I was. And, uh, whoops, I skipped somebody. Um, before the Davises were uh, the Halls, 
On the same side or different side? On the same side as the Davises, on the left-hand side as you're going into town. And uh, Abby and Alice uh, were the two girls that I knew. Alice uh, was just a, a couple of years older than I was, and Alice was older than she. And there was another sister, Edna, uh, whom I was old enough I, I did not know. They had five sons in World War II. And one of those sons was Charlie. And Charlie used to work on the farm for Willard Cummings. So as a lot of other farms uh, lost their help, there weren't any people. Uh, my brother was 14 years old, worked on that farm, had a license so that he could drive the farm trucks and the machinery and so forth on the road, legally. And uh, he used to go and help. Uh, Willard had cows, he had a garden. Uh, he used to cut the ice uh, in Melindy Pond every year and store it in the uh, ice house. Uh, they had a little business, uh, you know, uh, sandwiches, Coke, uh, candy bars, you know, things like that. And at one point, um, before he retired, uh, he had worked for French and Heald uh, Furniture Company, which is uh, where the county stores in Milford are today, on Nashua Street, French and Heald. And a lot of people ask, if you're in Milford at quarter of 12, and you're standing on the corner, and you don't expect it, the fire whistle is going to blow. Yeah and it's going to lift you right up <laughs> off the ground. Quarter of 12. That was the warning for the women that the men would be home for lunch in 15 minutes. So, you know, get ready. Uh, and, uh, and, and of course, French and Hill was, you know, one of the businesses uh, that was there. And um, so then the halls, the Davises, uh, Marguerite, uh, Wallet Cummings, Marguerite Cummings. They uh, were uh, across the street from the Davises. Uh, down the, yeah, on, they were on the right hand side. There was the uh, Halls, the Davises, the Pond. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, um, Luigi LaPlante. Tell us about him. And his wife lived next door to the Davises, and they had no children. Uh, I remember Luigi once saying, that uh, because uh, Brookline was dry, uh, if you uh, went to East Pepperell, it was five miles down and 10 miles home. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, his wife uh, was a nice, very quiet person. Uh, and as a child, I used to like to go and visit and talk with her. Then the pond, then the commons is on the other side. Um, then, uh, pause on uh, Willard and Marguerite for a while. Okay. Uh, what, tell us about she, Willard. Marguerite uh, was active in 4-H. Uh, she was uh, my 4-H leader for a number of years. And um, I spent 10 years in 4-H. And um, in fact, I, I just unearthed a, a blue ribbon and gave it to my daughter. Uh, it, I forget what the date was, uh, Hillsborough County Fair for gourds. I had raised gourds one year, and because um, my mother loved to decan and uh, do things, uh, jams, jellies, uh, relishes, and stuff like that, and she uh, had a little roadside stand, and, and my father had built for her, and he named it Green Shade. And, uh, you know, so uh, the gourds was one of the things that I raised one year to put on the stand. Well, let, let's talk about your house for a second before we move down the street too far. Uh, that house isn't there anymore, right? No, it's not. Public service took it. What do you mean? Public service cut. My mother worked hard, and she did housework and babysitting in her later years. And she bought up several of the landlocked wood lots that were behind our house. 
And of course, as kids, we had free run run of that. You know, I mean, uh, we, we um, the power line went through the back end of it, way up, and um, you know, we used to go out there and play and so forth. And it was a good place if you wanted to hunt deer. You'd see them every once in a while there. And uh, then, and she bought the uh, piece of land across the street, and the piece of land um, from. The Milford, Brookline town line down a ways where uh, there are several uh, houses that are built now. And um, the, their original plot of land that they owned uh, was on both sides of the street, Milford and Brookline. My father could sit at the table eating his meal and look out the window and see the signpost that the, you know, separated the um, two towns. And I can remember <clears throat> more than once seeing it stop raining at the town line, <laughs> and I have seen it rain across the street and not in our yard. You know, and, you know different uh, things uh, like that. But um, that he cleared the land there, and uh, he built that house. And what house. became of the house? Well, because public service decided that uh, they were going to put in through this new big power line. So they went diagonally through all of the land that my mother owned. And they were not um, very willing to uh, make much recompense, you know, and um, she fought it and so forth, but it took it took a lot out of her, it, it shortened her life, um, you know, because this is the house my father had built for her. Mm. This is the house that she raised our kids in. And <clears throat> to be sure, it wasn't a whole lot, but uh, it, it was there. And my father had fully intended to build another larger house. And then, of course, the Depression. So that took care of that, you know. And uh, so that what had intended to be uh, workshop and garage and storage and so forth, you know, was made into the house. And so we lived there. And, uh, but public service took that. And then they built um, the house that my daughter lives in now uh, on the um, upper piece of land that uh, they owned so that she was still on the same land, but, um, you know, it, 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 it was not the same for her. It never was. Mm -hmm. is, is it the brown house just north of the line? Is the, is the brown house just north of yeah, the line? Yeah, the one that has the Halloween and yeah. decorations yeah. and so on and so forth. Yeah, that that's uh, my daughter. Uh, um, Jenny, her, I'll, I'll tell you her name and she'll shoot her. <laughs> uh, Genevieve Eldora Reed Jellison. Uh, and, uh, you know, is um, she lives there. And uh, <clears throat> she had, um, she uh, and Rick have been there, and uh, she raised her daughter there. Uh, my daughter is now 37, granddaughter is 37, and um, I will be a great grandmother Christmas Day. Congratulations. And, um, you know, so that, uh, that there's a lot of history. Uh, but I suggest the name Noel. Uh, I'm not going to bother to suggest, and one of the things I am not telling either one of them uh, is that uh, twins skip generations, uh -oh. supposedly. And it was supposed to be my generation, and I would have dearly loved twins. It didn't happen, so of course Jenny didn't have twins. Uh, you know, I, I don't wish it on Melissa, five feet tall and 100 pounds, I, I don't wish that uh, to her. <laughs> But, uh, you know, if it was twins, it would be something to celebrate and then some. Well, but, good uh, luck. I'm just pleased that, uh, you know, and Jenny always wanted a Christmas baby, and Melissa was born the 9th of January. Close call. So it was a close call, but it, it uh, just didn't work out. So let's march down the street and go back to... Okay, okay. After Willard and Marguerite Cummings, on the opposite side, uh, was the Bowers house, and um, I'm sorry, I can't remember their their names, uh, but um, I, I'm pretty sure that he built that house. 
uh, I wouldn't swear to it, but I'm pretty sure he built it. And uh, they were nice, pleasant people. And as far as I know, they had no children, but uh, you know, it, uh, that house is still there. And then there are newer houses there, and then you go down over the hill on the other side, and Howard Dickey owned that uh, chunk of land. Uh, incidentally, in between the top of the hill and Howard Dickey's place, uh, used to be a sawmill, Hesselton and Caldwell. <clears throat> and uh, my father used to be the boiler man uh, in that. And uh, Harvey Page, uh, whose uh, family lived in Milford and, and Amherst and so forth around, um, I, I think Harvey was the Sawyer, but I, I can't swear to it, but he lived in the little camp that was there. And my father went down one day, you know, to see Harvey for something. And as he rapped on the door, Harvey opened the door and out comes the dishwater. Sure. Uh, you know, the, the <laughs> dishwater. And, you know, Your just, father caught it? Yeah. <laughs> and um, his, Harvey's daughter had beautiful, long, golden curls. My father used to call her Goldilocks. And um, she married... Uh, uh, a fellow from Amherst, um, Bragdon. She married one of the Bragdon boys and uh, lived there for a while. And I, I don't know where they are now. But, um, you know, but anyway, Howard Dickey. Um, Mabel, is that the, the big white house that's at a right it's angle? It's the big white house that has, what do they call it, uh, something... Um, Culture, uh, country culture, or something. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it, it, yeah. It's that shop. Yeah, oh, okay. that that's there, and uh, there was a big barn there too, and um, they uh, took care of. Um, I'm not sure whether he was a nephew or a grandchild, but there was Howard, and uh, her name was Obed. We called her Obi. Howard, and Obi, Dicky. And the son, the young man that they took care of <clears throat> was um, three, four years older than we were. Uh, his name was Raymond. Uh, he went to school with us. And um, uh, they had uh, friends um, that lived in Massachusetts uh, uh, who had come down from Nova Scotia. Now, I'm not sure whether Howard and Obed did or not, but they were related some way or other to, uh, you know, the people from Nova Scotia. And one of those people was Herbert Reed, whose son Frank I married in 1950. The first time I saw him, he was, uh, I was about nine, ten years old, and he was about the same, and he was playing trucks in the sand pile uh, <laughs> across the street from Howard's. Uh, Howard Dickey and my father worked together in the woods. And um, he had an old Studebaker. It was probably early 30s. And um, my father, um, after working in the woods with Howard and so forth, um, was night watchman for the Bourne uh, Duff uh, Company, uh, which was a woodworking uh, firm. They built uh, laboratory tables and so forth during World War II and um, different things, uh, which is now where Milford Paper uh, is on Elm Street, off of Elm Street in Milford. Would that be Hampshire Paper? Yes, I, I guess whatever they call it. And uh, that's where it is. Now, my father worked one shift, and Howard worked another. So every time when Howard was going to work to relieve my father, and he'd go by the house, and he'd blow the horn. Well, that old Studebaker horn used to go, go you know. And, and so we knew that Howard was on his way in, and my father would be home. Um, and when they worked together in the woods, of course, my mother would put up a lunch for um, my father, and uh, they would go off. Uh, Howard had a dog. Howard Dickey? Yeah. yeah. And 
it was um, like an Airedale. Uh, God knows, uh, I'm sure it wasn't pure, but it was, it was built in the color, the curly fur and, and the blonde color of an Airedale. And um, he loved my father. And um, I mean, and, and he used to bark like crazy, but I mean, he wouldn't have bitten his own fleas, I'm sure. You know, he, he was uh, just so gentle that, that he would lay down in front of the wood stove and the cats would curl up on top of him. You know, I mean, uh, he was just a gentle soul. And but he loved donuts. So, and my mother always ha made donuts uh, for us and for my father. And, <laughs> had to be one in his lunch pail every day for Teddy. And if you were in the house, if Howard was in the house and my father drove in, he'd say, Teddy, who's that? And right at the window, you know, out there to meet my father, you know, uh, looking for his donut, which he didn't always get, but you know, I mean, it, it was just, uh, and then um, the Craigs, moved into town, uh, that house I'll go to in a little bit, the, um, and he came from Nebraska, and uh, he was um, uh, a farmer out there, um, a truck farmer, and uh, so uh, he dug up a whole lot of um, the fields before you get to Howard's house there and uh, uh, would have a big truck garden there. And uh, he had two sons, Craig and Bobby, and Bobby died young. Uh, I don't know where Craig is. Um, the mother's name was Sadie. Um, dang, I can't remember the father's name, but Sadie Craig, lost her arm up to just below the elbow uh, in some kind of a meat grinding machine at Haywood Farms, uh, you know, uh, years back. And um, Sadie was a good uh, person, she was a good soul. And I can remember her um, many years ago uh, living in a trailer uh, in Milford on the road to Mount Vernon. And somebody broke in and scared the living daylights out of her one night. And so after that, uh, they, her uh, daughter-in-law saw to it that she was taken care of. And she eventually ended up at the Hunt home in uh, Nashua. And uh, I would I'd go to uh, visit her. And uh, the the daughter told me afterwards that I was one of the few people that uh, she would let see herself the arm, you know, she, it would, she would do something, cross her arms, uh, her coat, jacket, whatever, but uh, one of the few people that would let see her. And she used to sew, you know, and everything. Uh, she was just fabulous. And I remember going to visit her one day and she was talking about uh, how it was there at the home, and she said, you know, the Bible says, go into your closet and pray to God in private. That woman literally went into her closet to pray. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you have to um, admire, it may be simplistic, it, it may be fundamentalist, uh, you know, whatever, but uh, it was something that she did, and did on a regular basis, and uh, you have to admire that in older people. So then, down the hill from Howard Dickey's, the big white house, Lund had that house. I don't know much about them, uh, you know, but uh, that's who it was. And then, uh, the Keach place is the next one. And um, his first name escapes me, but some, I'm sure everybody knows it. Uh, and her name was Mabel. And, um, but the first Mrs. Keach died in childbirth. And uh, that child was Jane. 
There was a custom that we had in uh, grade school, the first five grades, uh, that uh, <clears throat> the last day of school, if you knew a child that was going to enter into first grade next year, you brought them to school for the last day of school, you know, which was a little bit of a celebration. And I remember Phyllis Cummings was the one that took me. I took Janie Keach. And <clears throat> the teacher that was there uh, in the third, fourth, and fifth grade room, her name uh, was Mrs. Morrell, and uh, she let me pull the, the rope to ring the bell. You know, big deal. Uh, <laughs> you know. Which building are we talking? The Milford Street School? No. The uh, Daniels Academy? No. The church? No, no, no. The, the, uh, <clears throat> El okay. You know which house was the Homoleskis? Yes. You mean okay, the, the, the next building up from that. Okay. Oh, is, that was the, the first five grades. Okay, you, you don't mean the center chimney cape, which is a residence. It used to have a little cupola. The, no. Well, I, I must have had a cupola because it was uh, oh. had a bell, so. Okay, mm -hmm. we know what you're, okay, yep. The Milford Street <clears throat> School. Yeah, right. <clears throat> yeah, the old one. Uh, and the um, flush toilets and the basement for that building were a WPA project. And my father worked on that. And that was uh, probably back in the, let me see, 38, 39, uh, right around in there. And you were a student there at that oh, time? Oh yes, I had my first five years of school there. Okay. And then we moved down to Daniels Academy and that was six, seven, and eight. Now uh, school only goes to sixth grade here, I understand, and then they go to Hollis. How, how many children were in a class, approximately? Well, I, I, the average was nine or 10. You know, so that uh, if you had 35, 40, 50 kids <clears throat> in the whole school, that was it, you know. And uh, I think my graduating class was nine or ten. I, I can't remember just now. There were a couple of kids. That, that, you know, there were kids that came in and left uh, along the line. Uh, as you can tell, you know, some of the pictures that Jimmy and I have had of the classes that uh, we, we've, uh, you know, given to you to copy and whatever. It, uh, but, uh, and then, there was a big hill. I mean, that, that building is built on a chunk of land, and that's it, and then it just drops off. And um, so that hill <clears throat> beside the school, and Minnie Maxwell and Norman Rockwell <coughs> and Helen Rockwell lived in that building. And there were other buildings there. They used to take in what were called fresh air children and, uh, <clears throat> you know, give them uh, a time and whatever. And it's my understanding that Norman and Helen were two of those kind of children. And when I was in school, um, I think it was Helen and Donnie Saunders were two children that uh, Minnie Maxwell was taking care of. Now there was a hill, <clears throat> of course, beside, you know, it went whoosh, and then right up again. We, that would get icy in the wintertime. We would slide down on whatever piece of board or paper or the seat of our pants that we could find and go down that hill and halfway up the other yeah. one. And then uh, there was a group of us that got really brave and the snow banks were high. And so uh, there was a, a, a big, building up at the top of the hill, and we would climb up the snow banks, get on the roof, and slide down, uh, which of course we got punished for. <laughs> and the uh, teacher uh, had, um, uh, there was a, a coloring section of our day, you know, you, you did coloring of pictures and so forth, and each one of us that had been up on that roof had to call, color a picture that showed a child sliding down the roof, and it says only a goof plays on the roof. <laughs> and, <coughs> so that was our <laughs> punishment for that. 
And then, of course, we had access to the ball field <clears throat> so that we could, you know, we could play ball up there. And uh, we used to do, uh, you know, all, all the kids' games. The sidewalk ran up uh, past the uh, building, and uh, we would draw our hopscotch and so forth onto the sidewalks. And there weren't enough people in town, you know, um, moving around so that we were impending anybody's, um, you know, uh, progress uh, walking around and so forth. And I remember <clears throat> there were three of us girls that were allowed to play on the boys' baseball team. <clears throat> Myself, Jean Gay, and Virginia Perkins. Now, <clears throat> the first time I got up the bat, and this wild ball coming at me so fast that you can't see it, I quit. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, when you stop and think about it, the oldest person that would be pitching the ball at you was a fifth grader, maybe 10 years old. What kind of control are they going to have? No, not enough to suit me. So oh, I quit. And uh, we used to do a lot of uh, jump rope. And of course, in the wintertime, we had the basements, you know, and that they were, you know, we could play games and so forth and then during the uh, bad weather. And uh, I remember we had a jump rope um, contest. Jean Gay jumped 200 and something. I jumped 232. And so I, I was the champion for that. You know, and um, I would hate to have to want to start to do it today. <laughs> you know, it, um, just, uh, it, it's a bit too much. You want to? Back up and continue down Route 13. Okay. Uh, I, I've got my coffee. Thank you. Thank you very um, much. Let me see. Uh, okay. I got as far as uh, the keychers. Oh, and he had a gas pump, too. The kind that you turn the crank in order to pump the gas out. And um, they had uh, little cottages that, uh, you know, for uh, tourists, you know, for people passing through. Because uh, before it um, was easy to drive 100 miles in a car, you know, that would be like halfway from Boston to someplace um, that people would be going. So that they had that. And um, now down on the same side, the next one, uh, when I was growing up, the Bazansons lived there. And they, uh, there was a girl that was around my age, and I, there were other children, I, I can't remember them. And then on the opposite side, the house that we, we always called the Carlton Place, and, and God knows why, probably somebody named Carlton owned it or built it or lived there at one point. And that's where the Craig family moved into. And there were three boys, I can't remember the younger one, he was, considerably younger than I was, uh, but uh, Charlie and Bobby were a little bit older than I was, and of uh, course it was their father uh, um, that uh, did the truck garden, and Sadie was the one that uh, had lost the piece of the arm. And then um, down on the other side, no, on the same side, is a house that's set up on the hill. Now, the Bowers people used to live there, and then they moved up further into the Northbrook line. Now, when we were kids and we lived across the street on the corner of North Mason Road, they were neighbors, and so I used to, you know, go up and uh, to see the lady. And then down on the other side, where there is a restaurant now, the house that's painted the shingles of blue. Oh, yes. Originally, that belonged to Ralph and Ivy Cox. And they can say lightning doesn't strike twice, which is probably true. Doesn't strike twice in the same place, but three feet away is not the same place. So, I mean, I don't know. But that house has burned at least twice. 
once when Harvey, uh, when um, Ralph and Ivy Cox had it, and they were great uh, you know, friends of uh, my family, and uh, they eventually um, bought a, a place uh, over on um, what is now Nichols Road uh, in Amherst, and uh, they had a, a girls' camp there. And so from the time I was 13 on, I w went to camp there. And um, when I got a little older, I helped with the uh, counselors uh, and so forth. But, um, and uh, this is a tale that I, I have to tell on myself. Um, when my parents would have to go off for something, uh, they, they would uh, have the coxes take care of me. And so they would, you know, uh, leave me there with them in their care. And uh, I was three, four years old at the most. And I was getting fussy. And it wasn't quite meal time. So they figured, okay, you know, she gave me uh, a, a slice of bread with some jam or jelly on it. So I blissfully walked into Daddy Cox's office and took the jelly side of the bread down and covered the keys and so forth on his typewriter, <laughs> which was never the same again. And even until the time I was a teenager, if we went over to visit and I walked in the door with my parents, he would yell, here she comes, hide the typewriter. You know, and <laughs> You know, so people will think I'm such angelic, just have no idea. Uh, but um, then, uh, and then Fred Berry had that place. The same house? And uh, they came from someplace in Massachusetts. And uh, uh, they, they were nice people, uh, you know, they were friendly people and so forth. And um, I don't remember too much about them, but... Um, you know, that, that's who had it. So uh, that, that house, what the shape of it is probably because it's what was rebuilt on an old foundation after the original built, because I just can't imagine anybody building a house that shape, and certainly not Ralph Cox. And um, Ralph Cox uh, was British, he still had a little bit of the Cockney uh, in his speech. During World War II, he was retreaded into the United States Navy as a recruiting officer. And uh, <clears throat> uh, that was during the time that I would be at camp uh, over there. It was called Camp Hideaway. And at um, he used to be in charge of giving the first IQ test that they would give to prospective, uh, you know, sailors. So it was a hundred multiple choice questions. And as far as I'm concerned, multiple choice is probably the easiest and the fairest because you may not be able to pull the whole thing out of your head, but if you see multiple choices, then you can uh, say, oh yeah, that's what that was, you know, and uh, it, it will trigger your memory. So there was a hundred of them questions. You only had to get 50 right to be considered okay for the Navy. Believe it or not, I guess there were those who didn't pass it. I think I got about 87 uh, at the age of 14. Uh, you know, so that, uh, but I, I remember that. And they had two children. Uh, the oldest daughter was uh, Ruth, and the uh, next one was uh, adopted, and it was Marilyn, who was uh, four years older than I. And, uh, all my life, uh, I was the recipient of things that Marilyn outgrew. Well, we were over there one day, and uh, we were visiting, and uh, they had her show off her new spring coat. 
And much to my mother's chagrin, <clears throat> I just looked at her in the new coat and said, you know, that's going to look nice on me. And <laughs> it, um, so the, the, the Cox family uh, had a very close relationship with us in many ways. Then when they gave up that uh, endeavor, the camp, on Elm Street in Milford, they opened a rest home. Uh, about three doors up from what used to be Draper's Garage. And um, I remember going and visiting them there. And um, Mrs. Nye, who was a resident of the town of Brookline, who um, uh, was um, grandmother to Peggy Ward, Peggy and Bobby Ward, and, uh, you know, Peggy Wood Hall, and, um, you know, <clears throat> so I remember she was there at that time, and I, I remember seeing her. Then, <clears throat> um, of course, uh, the Coxes were uh, very active in what was then the only thing uh, available to them was the American Legion. That was before BFW became, um, you know, uh, instituted. And so they <clears throat> used to go off uh, and sometimes, and my parents would go over and take care of the house or whatever for them. And um, the American Legion uh, used to give Christmas baskets. And um, through our relationship with Daddy Cox, even though we lived over the line into um, Brookline, the Milford Legion always gave us a Christmas basket. Oh, nice. So, you know, that um, uh, it pays to know people in high places. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the thing is that um, the barriers that separate people and towns and things just need to be broken down. I mean, we, uh, <clears throat> I just, I don't believe in just homogenizing everything and throw it in into one pot and stirring it. Then you get nothing um, except a mess. But, you know, th th this interaction and so forth between people uh, has been very wonderful. When we moved up there, one of the first years we were there, on the Milford side, our nearest uh, uh, neighbors were um, Sampson's, Oscar Sampson and his wife. And I remember her coming up uh, with Mrs. Daniels, who lived a couple houses further down, uh, and in between them was an elderly Finnish lady, and you know, all three of these people were Finnish people. and. Uh, Oscar worked uh, in the quarries, and uh, she came up and she had knit a pair of mittens for my brother and I. You know, you know we, we, she was just a neighbor, and uh, you know, because they had no children of their own, but she knit, and so she knit us each a pair of mittens. And, uh, you know, I, I'll never forget that, you know, because it, it was such a uh, welcoming thing and it was uh, such a wonderful thing to do and um, so okay now we need to go further into town um, the road used to go by what La the Quimby house yes uh, yeah it, it <clears throat> swung to the right it swung it to the right and <clears throat> went by the Quimby house and uh, that was a big house, and Loring lived there, and uh, Faith, uh, and I can't remember the rest of the family, but they originally lived on um, 130, going into Nashua, where the auction house is. Mm. They lived in there, and uh, then they moved out to that place. So, okay, now we're at Quimby's. You see, I get confused now because, okay, oh yeah, we, now we go across the highway. Hall Manufacturing used to be on your right. 
I'm sorry, you go ahead. I'll well, not when I was a kid. No. Uh, I, I, I mean, we, I, I'm just going by... Back then, yeah. Back then. Um, Harry Williams. Right or left? On the left. Tell us about Harry Williams. He was a barber, among other things. He and his wife loved to dance. They had a daughter, Pauline, who was challenged. And um, you always knew when Pauline was around because uh, she had a voice like mine, that cut cold steel at 50 paces. <laughs> and uh, she, uh, she was a caution. Uh, I can remember we were in the first national one day in Milford long ago when it used to be right there on the Oval. And uh, this lady was shopping and Pauline was going around and picking up, oh, this is good, that's good, off the shelves and piling it in the woman's basket and the woman is standing there, you know, just not understanding what's going on. And so my husband said to her, you know, he said, don't pay any attention to her, you know, she, she does that, it's okay, she's harmless, you know, but I mean, it just, it, it's crazy. And uh, when I was uh, somewhere around four or five, four probably, I had long golden colored ringlets, see all the gold. And uh, I cut my hair as far as I could reach on either side. Now my long hair was my father's pride and joy. Mm -hmm. And he was beside himself. And my mother finally convinced him that it had to be evened off, you know, he couldn't just you know, <laughs> let it go like that. It, it had to be, uh, you know, uh, taken care of. And so they took me down to Harry Williams uh, to have my hair cut. And, uh, you know, I, I remember that, uh, but, um, and, and um, my father always liked long hair uh, on uh, women, and um, I, I remember uh, cutting my daughter, daughter's bangs, she was about two years old, and my father had a fit because where he grew up in the backwoods, only the prostitutes had short hair and wore bangs. I didn't realize that. And I remember looking at him and saying, Daddy, I don't think she's going to get too big a clientele. And, uh, <laughs> you know, let it go. Um, yes, if you would. Uh, uh, the Austins, uh, Pam and Ellie are here. They're, they'll join us, but let's keep going. Let me let me touch on a couple of things because when you came this morning, you mentioned uh, the '38 uh, hurricane. Oh yes. What are your memories of that? Uh, <clears throat> see, I don't think we had a working radio at that time, and I, I remember going home from school and telling my father, "The kids say there's going to be a hurricane." And there was a breeze, you know, and he was up, uh, he was fixing the downspout on the uh, porch. And so uh, he said, oh, you know, he laughed at me, thought it was foolish and so forth. <clears throat> and of course, that night it blew up. But um, when we were kids, we would go barefoot all summer. And of course, the uh, roots of pine trees, you know, are, are not deep. They, they run right underneath the ground, and of course, uh, the um, um, roots would get uncovered, and we would be stubbing our toes, you know, and I'd be going around like Huck Finn all summer long with a rag tied around my uh, toe or something. And so, <clears throat> my father chopped off the roots so we wouldn't trip on them. Well, the house was like here, and the tree was not as far away from here as the other wall. <clears throat> I remember um, when the wind came up, and we were sitting there, and we could look out the window, and every time a wind, gust of wind would hit that tree, it would lift up like that, and you could see underneath the roots, and then it would slap back down again. 
And my father had just put uh, tar paper on the woodsheds. And it must, my mother must have died a thousand deaths. Um, when uh, he went out and he got up on the roof and he's taking edgings and uh, nailing them down so that the tar paper would stay on the roof. And so um, then, and of course the house was built down over a side hill, three stories high on the back, and every time, you know, the wind would hit it, it back and forth. So uh, he took a log he had and he wedged it between the house and the woodshed. And next morning, there was a crack in the dirt all the way around the house, at least a half an inch or, wide, or wider, uh, you know, where the house had moved uh, during the night. One of the things during the night, we heard this wicked crash. Now, <clears throat> Repon's barn, their house also set up on a hill, very high up. <clears throat> and the barn was built so that the uh, top of the barn, the, the major couple of stories, was on the level ground, but the rest of it was down underneath. And it was over the hill. And my father said, oh my gosh, that had to have been Rippy's barn. And so he said, I better go see, uh, you know, if they need anything. So he went tearing out. Well, it wasn't their barn. There was, um, in the lot above us, um, a pine tree that was so big around that no adult could, you know, go and put their arms around it. And the branches used to come down just like a tent. Uh, and we kids called it the Indian tree, Indian tent tree, because you could go in underneath and you could play, you know, and the branches were out of your way. It was that tree. And it was across the road. And so he came back and he said, they're okay, but it was that tree. So we did not lose anything on our land. The next morning, he went out to drive to work. And I, if I remember right the way the tree led, he could have driven over, over the tip of the tree. I mean, that thing had to be over 50 feet tall. I mean, it was huge. And... Uh, then he gets down the road a little bit to Jim Day's house, and there's trees crisscrossed all over the place. So he came back and, and told us about it. And then my mother, <clears throat> Grandma Markey, Jean Repon, and my brother, and uh, you see, I guess that was it. <clears throat> we walked around the neighborhood just surveying the damage. And Repons <coughs> excuse me, had a big grove of pine trees, as big as this room. And that was all down, every living one of them. Now, last night on television, they had a story about hurricanes and what causes them and why and so forth. That will repeat it again tonight on Channel 13 at 10 o'clock. The uh, temperature of the water and, and so forth, and it runs in cycles, 25 or 30 years. So we're due for one. Uh, you know, they've been uh, talking about it. But um, that 5% of New England's timber at least went down. Well, to me, it was like almost every pine tree in the state of New Hampshire. The government bought up the lumber from these trees and they were stocked in ponds the way that they did the logging down east. And so, of course, my father was familiar with that, and they put logs in Melindy Pond. And uh, a young engineer was there and was taking, you know, in charge of the job and so forth. He was taking care of it, and my father said, I'm not sure about that. I don't think that'll work. Yeah, it, it's, it'll be fine, you know, got it all figured out, so it's okay. So, well, to the young man's credit, he eventually came and got my father to ask him how to take care of things, and they did. Eventually, they brought in a sawmill, and um, on um, 
I don't know what the name of that road is now. That uh, Old go Melwood Road. What? Old Melwood. No, probably Hood Road. Yeah, you're right. Uh, that Road. that goes long beside the pond, uh, uh, across across from Willard Cummings. The, yep. the road so goes yeah, off. Old Melwood. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. And that's right, it does hold Milford. Uh, I have to stop and think where it starts and ends. And then um, they put the sawmill there and then they sawed up the lumber. Now, the um, lot next to us, a Leonard Repon uh, owned, and it was flat on the top and then went down deep, um, you know, and flattened out and, and to a field at the end of it. And they put the lumber down there and they stuck it out there to dry. Now, of course, that means piling the lumber up, the boards don't touch, and there are stickings, or what, which is about a, a however many feet long and an inch square, um, in between the layers so that the uh, boards have a chance to dry and season. And they, they used to call it sticking out the lumber. And uh, so they stuck that lumber out in uh, Repon's field. And what happened to it from there, I have no idea. But uh, I, I remember that. And the, uh, of course, the devastation along the coast was terrible, too. But for us, it was the trees. We lost the timber. And how, how many years does it take that to grow back? And even if it grows back, it's cut down for progress and for um, new buildings, uh, expansion. Uh, when I was born in 1930, the population, according to the census, that year for this town was 500. So I was 501, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whatever. But, uh, you know, that, that's the way it was. Now, yeah. I know one of your friends was Jimmy Austin. Oh, yes. And do you know Elliot? That's Joe's Hans? Ellsworth son. Yep. 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 Okay. Ellsworth. Ellsworth or yeah. Ellsworth Jr.? Yeah. Ellsworth Jr. Well, it's Anton Austin. My, my father was Ellsworth Allen Austin, and I'm Ellsworth Anton Austin. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 Because uh, I remember, well, you, you know something like Ellsworth. I remember Ellsworth Austin, uh, I mean, he was an imposing figure. He was tall, he, he was husky, he was not fat. I don't imagine that there was an ounce of fat on him. Uh, he, he was strong and so forth. But he's what you would call a gentle giant, and I can see the same thing in the face here. A gentle giant. <coughs> you, don't, uh, you don't meet too many of those people that you know right away. That person is a gentle giant. I can see it in him. <coughs> Years ago, when I, I was at the gym I, I met this um, college gentleman, and uh, I can't remember his name now, but um, he was a guard at uh, state prison. And I, I remember saying to him, boy, if I were in prison and I, you were my guard, I wouldn't dare to blink, you know what I mean? But the minute I laid eyes on him, I knew he was a gentle giant. I saw him work out. I mean, he could pick any one of us up and toss us, you know, I mean, it, it just, uh, but he was one of those people. Ellsworth Austin was. Oh, Jimmy was in my class. Leo Jr., who we always call Teeny. Mm -hmm. I'm the only person in the world that remembers calling him Teeny, but uh, we did. We <clears throat> and there was, um, uh, what was her name? Uh, something May, um, his uh, sister. Yeah. Yeah, and and then then did John Shirley. and and uh, Shirley. Who's the other one? But uh, they were younger, Dot. so. Dot. Dot. Yeah. Dottie. 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 Dottie May. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you know, it's, uh, but she was the only girl, right? Oh no, there's uh, Eileen and Shirley. 
Oh, they had to have been a lot younger than I am then. Yeah, they, they, were, yeah. they were the younger ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. you see, and, and uh, I didn't know them. Uh, you know, it just, Jimmy was a genius. He had a tremendous mathematical mind. He was a tremendously hard-working person. His vocabulary was extensive. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have a friend, Tom Summers, who grew up on the Marshall Place out by Pine uh, uh, Grove Cemetery. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, Tom Summers spent his teenage years working with Jimmy in the woods. <laughs> and he, he learned the skills that Jimmy was good at, you know, cutting and uh, limbing and, and, and all of that stuff plus whatever else. And <clears throat> Jimmy um, was in the Navy. And it's my understanding that uh, his rank fluctuated up and down depending upon the uh, rank of the officer he uh, insulted. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I can believe it. Uh, he, I understand, was in meteor meteorology in the Navy. And <clears throat> I, I had I talked to a woman several years ago who moved into this town and uh, said something about of the Austins. I said, whoa. I said, there have been generations and generations of Austins in this town. And they have lived here and made their livelihood here and raised their children here. I said, and, uh, well, and, and Jimmy, I said, you know, if he had, if he studied meteorology in the Navy, Look at what meteorologists do today. Look at the money they earn on television and whatever else. Jimmy could have done that, but Jimmy came back and did what he loved. He worked in the woods, in the town he grew up in. And, you know, I mean, I lambasted that woman all the way to Sunday and back because you don't say anything to me about the people that used to live in Brookline. Because I, I grew up here, and uh, to be sure, I grew up in the North End, but I went to school here, and I knew these kids, and they, they were absolutely fabulous. And um, look at what Teeny did for the Historical Society. And uh, I, I remember, you know, when Jimmy died, he had cancer. And Teeny told me, he said, you know, the, the chemo never made him sick. And I just thought to myself, yeah, because he had things so pickled that that couldn't <laughs> work. But that's, and I said that lovingly, because, you know, I mean, that was the way he was. And you took him as he was. And when <coughs> they had the hoorah over the bell on the 4th of July, I just said to somebody, it had to have been somebody that didn't know anything about the town of Brookline. Well, I guess it was a new officer. I said, anybody that lived in Brookline would know better than to take something out of the hand of an Austin that was doing what he wanted to do. You just would not do it. Because they were bound on what they were going to do, and if they had one under their belt, forget it. You know, you don't argue with people. You just... You just don't do it. And you know, I mean, and, and, and none of this I say in a derogatory manner because I love the Austins. Now, uh, Ellsworth, Austin, see, that was Frank Austin, wasn't it? Um, Frank is Leo's boy. Frank Austin is Leo's 
Leo Austin and Eva's. Yeah, but no, but the, the original oh. that, that lived down in the. Oh, yes. That, yes, that was really Frank there. Austin, oh. was yes. the oh, my, grandfather. Yeah, my grandfather. Great, yeah, yeah, great my grandfather. Yeah, sorry about yes. that. And um, I have been told that they bought that house by paying, you know, like 50 cents a month or whatever it was, rent, and bought that house and then raised their family. And that there, how many Austin houses are there down there now? How many families? Now it was what, two, three, two, three four? Four Austins. Yeah, yeah. I can say, more, it, 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 it's, that, yeah, it's a compound. Yeah, you know, it, it's a compound. Yeah, it's a compound. And, and, and uh, that's a wonderful thing because the uh, World War II did away with a lot of families being born and living in the same neighborhood, aunts, uncles, cousins, within spitting distance or hollering distance of each other, because the young men that fought in World War II mm -hmm. were of marrying age. And they, they married women from other countries or other parts of this country. And then, for one reason or other, they moved from here to there to the other place and so forth. So families now were split. There, there wasn't this continuation right, yeah. of, um, you know, aunts, uncles, cousins. But there is at least probably seven generations of Austins that live in this town. This is some of the stuff that Betty Quimby sent up. Do you remember any of that? What? That was during. Yeah, the, air raid wardens, air firemen, raid warden, police, yeah. fire watchers, nurses, aides. My yeah. mother took the first aid training that they had here. Road repairs, uh, Grover, um, Fowl, yeah. and uh, Arbo Betters, who was one of the houses yeah. down below, yeah. uh, too, you know, and. Demolition, electric, <laughs> and I remember really when a uh, 38 hurricane, uh, a lot of uh, trees, limbs, and stuff, you know, came down yep. in Pine Cemetery, and so my father went there and uh, cleared that up and was given whatever firewood he could make out of it, you know. Yep. Put out the lights. Oh yeah, blackouts. Yep. Boy, I and, and the uh, right here at the top of the hill was the lookout uh, station. Oh, okay. And uh, everybody had their um, uh, a turn there, and you uh, identified all the planes that were going over. And uh, you know that 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 was uh, you know really great. Yeah. And and it it just uh, I am proud that I grew up in this little town. I really am. You're not done yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not not of growing up, I hope. But, uh, <laughs> I'm only 86, I mean, give me an <laughs> well, My mother went, she was watching this way, and she saw all the trees from the hurricane just lay right over, just like wow. that. Yeah, and I can put, yeah. Between you know, Austin Road and uh, uh, You Street. know, it, it just, it was scary. It was yeah. really scary. And uh, I remember we, we sat on the end of the couch. Uh, my mother, would, she had an arm around each one of us. I was eight, David was six. And, uh, but it made a lasting impression on me. And two of the observations that uh, I made, uh, and I still, uh, when I still see this, the sky was yellow. Mm. There was a yellow cast to the whole sky and atmosphere that day beforehand, before it started. And then afterwards, the air was the freshest and the cleanest mm -hmm. that you would ever hope to breathe in. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it, it was tremendous. Mm -hmm. But uh, to me, I will see every once in a while now, not as much as was that day, but you see a yellowish cast to the sky mm -hmm. and something's brewing. You may not get it, it may be somebody further along they may have already got it, or maybe going someplace else. But uh, it, it's, uh, you know, for me, that is a warning. 
I, I'm going to say, I, I don't want to infringe on your time, but I just want to. You're doing a great job. One of the things <laughs> that I remember, and I remember, Teeting remembered this. We talked about this one night at um, historical meeting. Pete and Clara Shura, you know, had the house uh, down. It was um, the next house, or the house second down from where my Aunt Miriam lived. Miriam Jepson. Yes. <clears throat> and um, they had a little ice cream stand. Okay, and so down Meeting House Hill Road on the other side. Of it's on the same side as uh, Miriam's house was. Okay. okay. It's on on this side of the road going down the hill. Would that be the Searles? Do you know that? No. So that they had a little ice cream stand there. You could get a double decker yeah. for ten cents. <laughs> you know, and that was an ice cream cone with yeah. holes for two scoops. And um, and a single one of course was a nickel. Every year, and I don't know if they did it with the Daniels Academy, but at least the five grades that were in the elementary school. We were marched down by our teachers, and they gave us each our choice of ice cream, double dip, mm. double, you know, double mm. cone, and Pete and Charlotte. As far as I know, they had no children of their own. Now, when I got married, the reception was at Miriam's house, and Pete came up and gave me this little box, and in it, that a half a dozen soup spoons, round soup spoons, silver, that were Clara's mm. uh, I, I still, I don't know exactly where they are in the house now because I took down my display units to put up a new wall. But, uh, you know, th those, those are precious to me mm. because I, I have the memory of them giving us the ice cream, and of course, you know, I mean, any time you had an extra nickel, you were there you know, <laughs> getting an ice cream cone anyway. And, um, but that, that they did that for the children, and that, uh, that, that I, I had her silver, you know, her soup spoons. Uh, and, Mary, and, while you're at that location, we were talking yesterday about a place called the Greasy Spoon. Does that yes. mean anything to you? Oh yes. <laughs> now, that was across the I street. don't know if the building's still there. Is the building still there? I'm not familiar with that. Okay, no. down at the foot of the hill here. Me there, Meeting House Hill Road. Yeah. yeah, there was a circular driveway that went like this. Yeah, it's still there. Right. right. Yeah, okay. Okay. Is there a building? No. In the front? Okay, Never. that was what was the greasy spoon. What it was it? Was a it was probably, it was a good sized building. And there was probably uh, apartments uh, in there. Uh, Guy Campbell, who uh, was crippled, uh, um, lived there. And um, he uh, used to sell candy and stuff. Um, you know, I, 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 I don't remember much about that. It was not a place I was allowed to go. But it was called the Greasy Spoon. Now, don't asked me exactly why, but Teeny remembered the same thing. We talked about it, you know, it was a greasy spoon. But that is evidently down. Now, the building that's on the far end toward town of the uh, thing is where we probably were living before we built the house up in North Brookline. Uh, that house was owned uh, by uh, Blanche Morse who was Clarence Morse's um, wife. And um, let's see, uh, she and, uh, if I remember my genealogy right, she and Jenny Fessenden were sisters. Uh, you know, that there was a relationship there, and I think it was that they were sisters. I may be wrong, uh, you know. But uh, it, it, there was a relationship there. Nelly, what was your dad's name? Ellsworth. And you knew that Ellsworth? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay. If, 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 if the Ellsworth I know would mm -hmm. be the son of Frank. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's his yeah. 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 General Giant. Yeah. 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 That's exactly yeah. what I called him. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That's exactly what I called him, was a General Giant. Yeah. Yeah, he was. He was the best. Yeah, I mean, and I never thought about it until just now, you know, and, and, and seeing you, you your, your... Mm. Ellsworth. 
Yeah, Ellie. Everybody Ellie. calls me Ellie, but yeah. Okay, Ellie. Ellie. Yeah, and um, Alita. Yeah. She lives across the street. Yeah, yeah, and um, the, their burial plot is near ours up here mm -hmm. in uh, Lakeside. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I know my mother used to go and water the flowers uh, for yep. her, uh, you know, and, um, you know, I did some years, too. I haven't been up there for a while. I'll go today. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it just, uh, my father wanted to be buried up there looking at the lake. Mm -hmm. And so he did. Uh, it, it's, yeah, uh, lots of there, and you know, Pam's grandparents yeah, my, lots of My grandfather's Willard Cummings. Yeah. Yeah. Did you hear her? Willard Cummings is her oh, grandfather. Oh, yes. Oh. <clears throat> okay, your Phyllis's, Phyllis's yep. daughter. daughter. Yes. All right. I just and you know, I, I was talking about uh, Marguerite and uh, Willard here, and uh, she was a rule. Mm -hmm. uh, her and uh, Grandpa Rule uh, lived in Hollis, and uh, he one of the times he came to the house and flapped his felt hat on. He had a a hornet in it, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know I, I remember that, but uh, now Phyllis was four years older than I, uh, but even then, there, you know, there were not many people in the neighborhood, and I remember um, several things. One of the things was, and I was thinking about it the other day, because uh, there was a commercial that showed a kid on a handmade swing. Will it hung a swing? from one of those trees on the opposite uh, side of the road from the house. And the limb was probably higher than, than the beams here. I mean, it was way up. It was so high that we used to be able to pump ourselves up to the point where the rope, the rope would go slack <laughs> and we would drop down and then come back. And I think to myself, oh my God, you know, and uh, <laughs> if um, our folks knew half of what we did when we were kids, they would have died of fright, <laughs> worry or something years ago. And that was something about my mother. She, um, she led us into the woodlots out back to go and play. You know, we would, the whole day, you, you come home for lunch and you go back out. There wasn't a tree with a branch that I could reach that I that was strong enough that I hadn't climbed. And, and my brother could shinny, I couldn't. And, and what I couldn't climb, he could shinny. And um, there was a big hemlock tree out back of the house. And hemlock branches are apt to be pretty uh, uh, let's see. Uh, they snap easily, you know, and uh, so as we got older, we were forbidden to climb it because uh, that thing was way over 50 feet tall. I, I had been up there until, you know, the top would start going like this and then I would quit. And so, I don't know, by the time I was someplace long in my teenage years, we were forbidden to climb it because my father figured we were too heavy and the branches would drop. Every year after that, until I was 20 or 21 years old, I climbed that tree. <laughs> I just, it was just, you know, it's like a rite of passage, you know? <laughs> and I'm still here to tell about it because I was careful enough to choose my branches. Mm -hmm. Does that sound like your childhood? Yeah, it's more. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kristen, Kristen was uh, our oldest daughter. She was a Climb yeah. yeah. Grab the top of the tree and make a little nest and sit there. Yeah. So. Or, well, she used to yeah. hide in the Dutch oven in the kitchen yeah. and shut the door behind her. She, yeah. she could get in and sit down and then shut the door behind her. Yeah. yeah. And of course, one of the things I remember um, is the steam train that used to go through here. I heard about it, yeah. yeah? And, uh, you know, I, I remember uh, my Uncle Fred took me uh, once, um, I don't know, I think I was about six or so, and, you know, down to, uh, they lived, the house is not there any longer, but they, they lived in a house, uh, if you're going down Bond Street, it would have been on the left-hand side. Uh, it, uh, and it, it's pretty frightening. 
I know. You know, when you're six years old, that train's a whole lot bigger than you are. And it's making all kinds of noises and stuff. Uh, I don't think it was the noise that uh, uh, bothered me. And he said to me, are you afraid? And I said, no. And, uh, <laughs> but it, it, it is, it, it, it's, a, it's a bit scary. I remember one story uh, that I just want you to touch on vaguely, and it involved lightning at your house. And oh, yes, yes. Uh, I was 16. And um, let's see, my father was upstairs. Um, he'd gone to bed early. And my brother was downstairs doing something, my mother, and I was sitting on the end of the couch and I had an extension cord hanging over me so I could see I was uh, typing, you know, something. And um, the lightning was fabulous, you know, I mean, the colors uh, were just, it was close, you know, I mean, and they had taught us in science class at school, you count the seven seconds, you know, and I'd been counting the seven seconds, and all of a sudden, there's no second to count, came in the gable upstairs, hit the light, 